You'll never work in London again. You're finished. What would you say are the biggest lows and what have they taught you that you've yeah. experienced? So I'd gone from this achieving my career ambition to be a listed CFO to being asked to leave in 18 months. There's a few things I found quite hard initially about being CEO. Hey, it's Jake here from the High Performance Podcast. I want to start by saying big thanks to all of our new subscribers. This channel is growing like crazy, but most people that watch these videos on YouTube don't subscribe. And it's so important to us. If you can just hit the subscribe button, it grows our channel. The bigger the channel grows, the greater the names we can attract, the greater the names, the more important the conversations and the more impact we can have on your life. So please, before you watch this video, just hit subscribe right now. It's a game changer for us. It's also fantastic for you. But right now, enjoy the video. Well, Steve, welcome to High Performance. Thanks very much. First question is, what is your definition of high performance? So for me, it's, it's, doing, um, it's doing amazing things that you probably maybe didn't think you were capable of. So pushing to be that best version of yourself. I think it also starts with you've got to want it. So high performance doesn't happen unless you put set yourself that ambition, you put effort in. You've also got to be resilient because high performance doesn't happen every day. It goes in ebbs and flows. And so overall, I think one of the best measures of high performance is whether you can deliver it consistently over a period of time and you can sort of ride those highs and lows but produce something amazing over a consistent period. And you've done it over a, a long period of time. You're sitting here as a very experienced CEO, but if we wind the clock back to the early days in your career, was this mindset there then or did certain things happen that, that kind of led you down the path that you've been on? Yeah, I think I've always had a I've always had a determination. So from a very young age, if I if I decided I wanted to do something, I, I've always had this determination. But it hasn't always produced amazing outcomes. You know, I think particularly when I when I look back, you know, I I tried lot tried lots of things. Uh, you know, I didn't have a particularly outstanding academic uh, career, for example, uh, uh, record, for example. And I think when I look back, that's partly because. I was much more motivated to play rugby when I was at school than I was really, you know, to study Latin or, you know, history or geography or whatever. And so if I couldn't see the link with an outcome that I thought was interesting, I found it very hard to really get excited about it. So I think where I'm passionate and where I can, where I'm, I'm invested in an outcome then I've always had that kind of drive to to get to something, but in but when I was younger, I, if I wasn't interested, I've got much better at doing things I also don't enjoy quite so much, but I see as essential. Whereas yeah. when I was younger, if if I didn't if I didn't get a kick out of it, I I kind of didn't really do it. It's quite an interesting topic to pick out for a second, actually, that because I think a lot of people feel they've only found high performance. You know, you see it all the time. Find your passion. Find what you love doing. <laughs> find what makes you happy. Find what makes you float and fly. Like the truth is, quite often high performance is also doing the stuff that you don't want to do. So yeah. how have you come to terms with that? Yeah, I think I think what I've done over time is is you know I've I've you fall in love with the outcome. So what is it? What is it that we're trying to achieve? What is what is it that that is that kind of north star that excites us? And then you know you you just get to learn over time that if you want that north star, there are a lot of hard yards. And I mean, I've never met anyone who is consistently uh, achieving high performance that doesn't put a huge amount of effort in and who doesn't have highs and lows. Because in order to achieve that outcome, you have to be prepared to experiment. And I think when you're younger, you probably worry, you probably worry too much about outcomes or how you are perceived. And actually, it's probably getting worse with social media, et cetera, right? And so I think you worry too much about as you're going along the journey, how am I being judged? How am I being seen? Well, you you can't be brilliant and high performing at every single step. No, nobody can. The best people, the the most elite athletes in the world, have days where it doesn't gel, it doesn't work, and so I think that determination and and as I say, so falling in love with the outcome then drives you that when you hit those obstacles, you get up, you kind of brush yourself off and 
you don't um maybe maybe when you're younger as well when you hit those obstacles you overreact to the lows and you probably overreact to the highs as well and i think when you when you as you get a bit more experience certainly i've found that the best comes from you know by all means celebrate the highs but don't get carried away because it is about being consistent and driving your way through those ups and downs. So we'll come on and talk about the highs in a minute, Steve, but I'm interested in the lows then, because like you say, so many of our interviewees have told us that that's where they've discovered more about themselves. What would you say are the biggest lows and what have they taught you that you've yeah. experienced? The first really big low uh, was one of these classics where I had a really big high and then I had a really big low, which was... Um, I'd had a, a pretty, you know, kind of, you know, typical career up until uh, my late thirties. Working, I was a, a qualified as an accountant, had lots of, you know, good jobs, and and was given lots of really good stretch roles. Was great, and then in my late thirties, thirty nine actually, um, I became the CFO of what at the time was GC, later to be renamed Marconi. Um, and I was 39 years old, 10 billion revenue company, making a billion of profit, was FTSE 20, so it was you know, one of the 20 biggest companies in, in the UK. And at the time, I wasn't the youngest, but I was one of the youngest CFOs on the FTSE. Um, and I always remember I, I was appointed on the 10th of April um, uh, 2001. Six months later, we'd done two profit warnings. The chairman... The CEO and the deputy CEO had all left, um, and a guy I'd previously worked for had taken over as CEO. But and it was the dot com crash, so demand had just you know sort of dried up. The company was still um, trading profitably, but during the boom years, the team had gone on a big acquisition spree, and we'd taken on four billion pounds of debt, which. We no longer, although we were profitable, there was now very little prospect we'd be able to repay that debt. So I'd got, I'd become um, CFO because I had a lot of operational experience. But now I was faced with the prospect of renegotiating the, the debt financing package with the banks, um, which I'd never done before, which I did. So we had a, a group of 35 banks and hundreds of bondholders because the debt was half bond half half bank finance and i negotiated a a, a revised uh, financing package which took about six months but in the meantime the market had continued to deteriorate and so we got to a point where i went to the board uh, with that and i said look we've got a package here a refinancing package we could sign but if we sign it i think in a year's time we'll be back at the table because we have no prospect of paying this four billion of debt off is the truth. So what we really need to do is a fundamental restructure where we do what's called a debt for equity swap, which is basically we, we give the equity to the banks and the bondholders, we restructure the whole thing, but then it's in a fit shape for the future. That took another year or so to do, which we did, and at the time it was the largest debt for equity swap, swap in Europe. At the end of that process, the banks approached my chairman and said, this is great, but we think Steve needs to go because, you know, he's he's negotiated very hard. He's left a bit of a sour taste in everybody's mouth. So it would be much better if we just had a, you know, let's draw a line in the sand. So the chairman and I had, and I'd been with them for 13 years. So I'd started as a factory accountant and worked my way up to be group CFO. So I'd gone from this achieving my career ambition to be a listed CFO, to being asked to leave in 18 months. And that was pretty, I mean, that was, you know, sure. that was a pretty severe contrast. But it was the right thing. It was the right decision because nobody was happy, if you see what I mean. Yeah. I mean, I'd negotiated a fair deal, but literally nobody involved in that negotiation was happy. They were all sort of equally unhappy but it was the right thing for the company did you recognize the feedback that the banks were giving to your boss yes i think because and it, and it, people have asked me a number of times actually during that whether did i ever think about whether at the end of it 
I was sort of sacrificing anything personally. And I can honestly say that I, that isn't how I thought. I, I just was determined. I knew we had a healthy company that just had too much debt. And I remember I'd worked my way up, as I say, from being a factory accountant. So all I could think about was the thousands of jobs that we had to save the company. We had to put it into a position where it could survive long term. And if at the end of that, I needed to go and do something else, well, so be it. It took me a while afterwards. So my rational brain said, yeah, I get that. So I didn't really argue with the chairman. I said, yeah, I get it. No problem. You know, let's, let's kind of move on. And I remember agreeing. He said, I think it'll work best, Steve, if we, if we announce it, um, the, your number two takes over, and then you stay for six months to help him through the transitional period. But I think if we're, if we're going to do this, we need a bit of a clean break. So let's agree how it's going to work, and we'll literally announce it in the next few weeks. Um, and this taught me a very valuable lesson because I'd been there 13 years. I thought I was a very, you know, really important part of the fabric, so to speak. We announced it, and literally within a week, nobody was coming for me, to me for my, any advice. Nobody was, you know, the communication with me had sort of ceased up. And I remember going to um, somebody who I'd worked who I'd worked for, a more experienced boss, and I said, I can't believe this. You know, I said that we a week ago I was the CFO, and he said, "Yeah, but now you're not, Steve." And how did you? I mean, that sounds like quite a bruise to the ego as well. And you must have had a healthy ego to to put yourself in these positions to to eventually be trusted as like as as a CFO at such yeah. a young age. How did you? What? How the, did you handle it? The thing that it really taught me, and obviously, look at the time, did I feel bruised? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it took me it took me a while to kind of come to terms with what had happened, um, but of course, it it's not it's not personal, right? And it, it it's not about you. It's it's about the bigger team and it's about the bigger organisation, and it's not personal. You know, I mean, when the when the chairman sat me down, it wasn't like you know, Steve, you've done a you've done a terrible job here. You know, we need to get rid of you. It was it was very much. Steve, you've done the right thing. You've done, you absolutely have done the right thing. You've negotiated a really great outcome for the company, but the right thing for the company now is for you to leave. And, and so, you know, that probably, to be honest, that probably took me a few years to fully compute from a personal perspective. I mean, I'm quite a rational person. So at the time I sort of, it was all very rational. The emotional part, probably came over the course of the next few years because I, what I did was I left I left GC and then I went and I did some consulting. So for a couple of years, I worked with a, 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 a friend of mine and we just did sort of troubleshooting consulting. We took advantage of the fact we'd got this restructuring experience and we just sort of touted ourselves around as, as um, experts. And I remember one of the bankers uh, said to me um, after this was when I was leaving, um, I was at some event, I can't remember, and, and um, said to me, you'll never work in London again. You're finished. And I thought, well, that's a bit unnecessary. You know, I mean, <laughs> really? Um, wow. But that bank was re particularly, um, they didn't like the uh, agreement. They didn't like the, the final structure we'd come up with. So I remember I went and uh, did my consulting, et cetera, and then I thought, you know what? I want to I wanna have another crack at this. I was... You know, this was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a public company CFO. I thought, I can't leave it there. I can't just, that can't be the way I sort of finish, if you like, my public company career. So I thought, no, I want, I'm, I want to do that again. So I couldn't get, I couldn't get a big FTSE 100 job. So I went to a company that was FTSE 250, a bit smaller, um, did that for a couple of years. Then I went to a company called Inventus, which was on the verge of being FTSE 100, became FTSE 100. Um, so I did another two public company CFO jobs. And that was part of me proving to myself, and I guess also indirectly others, that, you know, I I had a lot to offer and I wanted to I wanted to come back and show that I could win people over and I could, you know, it wasn't my fault that we'd ended up in that situation. 
what I was trying to do was protect or do the best job I could for all stakeholders, which basically meant none of the stakeholders were particularly happy. So can I come back to that comment then from that banker that tells you that you'll never work in London again? Because I'm intrigued at exploring that topic of you can disagree without being disagreeable. Yeah. So maybe people weren't happy with what you'd negotiated yeah. when you were yeah. when you were trying to represent the company and save all those job yeah. jobs. But then that sounds like that banker has taken your disagreement about what the best way to restructure yeah. the loan is. Yeah. And, tr- and made it disagreeable. Yes, and made it very personal. So so where do you stand on that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, you it's very important, um, and it's an important part of high performance, to have differing views, to challenge, and to explore the right outcome for a particular situation. Um, and as soon as you become somebody who is only interested in the outcome for you, for you personally, well, then you're not contributing to that wider uh, discussion, are you? So as you say, that is a really good phrase. You're becoming disagreeable because you're making it a personal thing. Now, now for me, you know, if you take this situation that I'm talking about, there were thousands and thousands of stakeholders, including all the people who worked in the company. This one banker is just one player who has a particular view about what works for them. Now, that person got overruled because the wider banking group approved the deal, and so this person was particularly upset about something for them personally. I I just don't think that's that's not acceptable. That's not not behaviour that, you know, any of us want. You have to ultimately sign up to collective, you know, responsibility. You can't always, you know, one person can't veto... The whole thing it doesn't doesn't work. We we talk a lot about culture in business these days because it's important. And yeah. there are people that listen to this podcast who may well be in your position and experienced CEO of a huge business. But we also have a lot of self starters, entrepreneurs, yeah. Yeah. small business owners who struggle with exactly the same thing, perhaps just on a different scale. Yeah. Can we talk for a bit then about how to create the right culture in a business? Yeah. Obviously, you've got some big learnings there, and I wonder how much those moments, those personal moments, that perhaps sense of injustice when you when you left GEC and a few other moments in your career, I wonder how much they inform the kind of culture that you tried to create in, in yeah. your business now. I think the, fir- the first thing to say is, you know, Sage, um, you know, we, we serve small, mid-sized businesses. So my, my customers are all small, mid-sized businesses. So I spend a lot of time talking to small mid-sized businesses a lot of my friends run small mid-sized businesses and so that thinking about what's important to them and the tone they set within their businesses is also an important ingredient for me right because that's who I'm serving so you know I've I've said a number of times since I became CEO you know we when we're serving those small mid-sized businesses I believe I believe that you know, humility and, and, you know, being being humble and not being too self-centered is, is an important um, part of the culture that I've sought to create. But even if you didn't think that was the right thing to do, if you didn't have that, you would struggle to serve your customers. Small, mid-sized businesses generally are people who have, have gone into business. They have multiple different reasons for doing it. You know, not everyone sets up a small business because they want to become super wealthy. They do it for a whole variety of different reasons. And if you go into a conversation with a customer and they think it's all about you and not them, right, it, it, that's that's not the relationship they're looking for. They don't like it. They it, it You know, look, I'm from the north, right? You know, I mean, in Yorkshire, if you start a, a conversation about yourself rather than the person you're talking to, it immediately puts people in the wrong frame of mind. So I felt, you know, CEO, the culture I've tried to create is, yes, it's high performing, but it's high performing in a very, it's respectful, right? Behaviors matter, values matter. How you treat people matters. You know, when I I first became CEO of Sage, um, when my predecessor left, uh, the chairman said to me, we're going to run a, an external search. And um, do you want to be a candidate? And I said, do you know, I'm, I'm not sure I do. I'm not sure I really want to be CEO because 
I think we I think we've lost the dressing room a bit. I think we've lost people. I, I think, and I was part of that. You know, I was the I was the CFO. So so. I wasn't the CEO, but I was still part of the team that I felt where we'd, we'd kind of lost a and, little bit. And why bit. and how had that happened? I just think we'd lost, we'd, we'd lost the hearts and minds because it had become, we'd, the performance was starting to drift. So we were going through a big transformation. Transformations are all about highs and lows, right? They do not go smoothly. And we were going through one of those periods where things weren't landing. It wasn't working. We ended up having to do a profit warning. Um, and then we got into we got into a bit of finger pointing instead of really owning it and and as a team really figuring out what was going wrong, we got into a bit of a spiral around whose fault it was and all this sort of stuff. And so I said to the chairman, "I'm not sure I'm the right person to sort that out, but you know I'll do the job on an interim basis." And you you go kind of figure out um, you know who's the best person to do it, um, and then I decided whilst I was interim I was going to focus only on internal because I felt that was the issue. So actually in those first three months I didn't really speak to any customers, I didn't do any uh, external interviews. I just travelled round talking to people. I did loads of skip levels. So I didn't just talk to senior people. I walked around the offices, all open plan. I walked up to people. I talked to them. I just talked to as many people as I could. And I, as I was doing that, I, I, I thought, do you know, I think I know, I think, I think I, I think I get this. I think I'm starting to know what the issue is here. I think I could maybe do something. And there was this pivotal moment. I'll never forget. I was in, in Atlanta, which is our uh, headquarters of our U S business. I was doing all hands. It was probably a couple of hundred people there. And I'd settled on this format where instead of presenting, I would just let someone interview me. So this guy, Terence, was interviewing me. And uh, he said, oh, can we, have a, can we have an update? Where are we on the CEO search? And I gave one of these kind of pretty pathetic, slightly political answers. We're doing what I we did. can. Yeah, it's a exactly. long process. Yeah, a long we've got process. to get it right. You know, yeah. We've got to find the best person. da 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 yeah. Anyway, he sort of interrupted me and he said, "But have you have you applied? Are you a candidate?" And I said, "No, no, no. I don't look. I don't think I'm the right person. I think we need to find somebody really experienced in the industry, etc." And he said, "Well, I think you'll find there's 200 people in this room who, if you decided to be CEO, they'd be right behind you." And they all started clapping. Wow. And I suddenly thought, "Wow. Okay." So I went back to the uh, chairman and I said, "Well." Look, if you find somebody who's amazing, obviously fine, but I'm softening now. It might be something I want to, I want to do. And then the headhunter who was doing it um, ended up saying to the, to the board, look, we found you a few candidates, but the truth is the best candidate is Steve. You should give him the job. So, so I took it. And the first year or so, I found it really, really hard. Really harder hard. than the interim. So much harder, so much harder because... I hadn't really, I hadn't really prepared myself, if that makes sense, because I hadn't intended to do the job. So I think the board expected me to have this master plan, whereas actually I, I didn't really have a master plan other than I had this sort of slightly loose idea that I was going to persuade 12,000 people to buy into what we were trying to do. Um, which is, you know, ultimately we, you know, we want to be one of the leading, you know, tech companies in Europe. Our purpose actually is to knock down barriers so everyone can thrive. So whether that be our customers, whether that be colleagues internally, whether that be society, etc., we're here to do good, right? And so creating an emotional connection, that mission I said earlier, you know, you get the best out of people when people think, Wow, this is cool. I want to do this. Yeah. I mean, what's not to like supporting small mid-sized businesses around the world to flourish? I mean, that that's a that's a pretty cool thing to do. So I spent the whole first year pretty much doing what I did in the first 3 months, which is traveling around a lot trying to win people over. I spent a lot of time looking at if we're going to have values, they need to mean something. You go so many places where the values are on the wall, and then if you covered them up and asked people what they were, they'd be, they'd be like, Ugh. so I said, we, we got to a point where we said, 
we're going to have sub values we're going to have four values but we're going to have this overriding value which is we do the right thing so and i use that all the time if we're making decisions we're talking about something i'll often say to people do you think that's the right thing to do morally right yeah but uh, morally right is it right for all our stakeholders right so people always people will sometimes say you can't you can't do something equally for all your stakeholders no no you can so colleagues customers society shareholders they're my four stakeholders so if we're doing something is it the right thing for those four sometimes there's a trade off but if there's a trade off be honest that there's a trade off so we might do something for a customer for customers where we say well in the short term that doesn't really enhance colleagues experience because they've got to do something which is which is a bit harder it's a bit more inconvenient for them but we're doing it because it's the right thing for the customer and we know that we will be able to resolve it for the colleague in due course and if you're getting close to the edges so if someone goes well I'm not sure whether it's the right thing well it's probably not then is it right because you kind of know now we then have guiding principles of it's got to be human right so in an increasingly digital world yes in lots of interactions are digital but we're human beings we serve small mid-sized businesses they are people they're not corporates they're not faceless corporates with ever changing people most of our customers you go and see them year after year after year well it's often the same person because it's their business they employ their family their friends these are human beings and if you treat them with with respect and you treat them as human beings and you engage with them guess what people tend to work with you for longer you know we talk about customer for life it's a genuine thing customer for life because if you're dealing with small mid-sized businesses and you serve them well and you look after them and you make their lives easier they do stay with you for life can i ask you um you said i had to go around and win people over you know win hearts and minds mm. it's something that a lot of people struggle with yeah would you mind sharing some advice for people <laughs> listening to this who are in a position where they need to go and win people over or they need to share their message yeah. or make people feel empowered yeah. or bring people on the journey? What what do you do that you yeah. could share? I'll tell you, I, I found that there's a few things I found quite hard initially about being CEO. Um, I'm an introvert and actually that was one of the barriers initially that when I thought about being a public company CEO, I was like, well, I just I won't be able to do it. I'm this too. And you know I'm I'm happy to be out of my comfort zone, but this is this is a step too far. So even doing something like this or doing external interviews. I remember the first time I went on TV. I mean I was just you know in such a state. Yeah. I mean because I just mentally had, had. So when I when I talk about winning people over, that means walking into a big office open plan office, hundreds of people. And it means walking down that floor and it means going up to people and talking to them. Set pieces are important. So all hands meetings, you know, having people in a, in a, in a meeting room, etc. But they're all orchestrated. If you walk a floor, the more junior the person you speak to, but when you haven't warned them you're going to speak to them, the more honest they are, right? Mm. What's the best question that you find elicits a I great always, answer? So I always try and uh, I, I follow a similar pattern. I always say to people, so how's it going? You know, what what's working well for you? And then I laugh and I always say, but what I really want to know is what's not working so well, right? What are, you know, you've got a chance to tell the CEO, what's not working so well. But you have to kind of break the ice. You know, if you just walk up to someone and go, you know, what's, their what's not is, working? <laughs> I can't possibly tell no, this exactly, guy what's not exactly, working because that's exactly, going to come back on me. So, exactly. you ha so there you has have to be that vulnerability. Exactly. And... So you have to build up a bit of uh, trust. I sometimes uh, do it in a, a slightly jovial way as well. I'll say things like, you know, and I say this to customers as well. If you were me for the day and you had a magic wand and you had my, my CEO powers, what would you do with them? And what tends to be the most common response you get to that question? It, it varies, but it oft, mo for most people, um, there will be something 
locally, which is really getting on their nerves. It's not, it's not normally big things. I'll give you an example. We, I was in South Africa uh, a few weeks ago and I did exactly this. I was walking around and uh, somebody, I said, what, what's the thing that's kind of, you know, getting under your skin at the moment? And this lady said to me, I don't understand why you took away the fun budget. And I was like, right. What, oh, you what, took it away. Yeah. It's like, what, what, can you explain? What do you mean? What do you mean I took away the fun budget? And she said, we used to have a budget, uh, quite a small budget, which meant that we had total freedom locally to decide if we wanted to do, have a few you know, pizzas, a few beers, we wanted to have a bit of an event, take people out bowling or whatever. We had a, we had a, a local budget and it's gone. And I said, right, where's it gone? And she said, well, you've taken it away, Steve. You, you've made it all global. And I said, thank you. That's really, really valuable feedback because I know exactly how that's happened, but it's a, it's a completely unintended consequence. We didn't intend to do it that way, but what's happened is as we've gone to be a more global company and we've gone more into global functions, these things that were held locally have got swept up into global cost centers. And so for that person at the sharp end, sitting in South Africa, working long hours, and I, don't, I mean, at the moment in South Africa, they're having power cuts all the time, etc. So they have all these things that, all these headwinds against them. And the thing we'd done to most upset them was the fact that when they're in the office, they're now told they can't just order out for pizzas. So. That's an easy Did fix. Did you unpick it? But I would never... Yeah, so we fixed that. We're now putting those, those fun budgets right. back in. But, but nobody... If I didn't travel around, no senior person is ever going to give me that feedback. Are they? Yeah. Ever, yeah, right? Of course. The only person who's going to give you that feedback is the person on the ground. I remember, I remember talking to a customer as well, because um, we've got millions of customers, right? And I remember the, the first time I spoke to a customer, a small customer who I think was paying us £10 a month. And, and she was like, but, but you're the global CEO. You know, I pay you £10 a month. Why are you ringing me? And I said, because I want to, because I want to know what your experience is, right? I said, can you imagine, as, as the global CEO, does anybody ever really give me honest feedback about how my smallest of customers feels? So you're one of my smaller customers. I want to know what it feels to be a small customer in Sage. Because if I talk to our biggest customer who gets loads of attention from the account management teams, et cetera, they're probably gonna tell me it's a pretty good experience. I wanna know what your experience is like. And you just learn so much, don't you, when you, when you do that. But is that my comfort zone, speaking to someone I've never met before, just asking them questions? No. As I've done more and more of it, I really enjoy it now because, because it's really interesting. But the first time I did it, I was worried exactly what either a colleague or a customer would say. I was thinking, well, God, you know, they'll have a list of demands. I mean, what am I going to do? I'll have to, I'll have to, I'll have to respond to it. And I don't know how to, but of course the truth is most people are very, very nice and polite and they tell you the truth, but they're not aggressive. They're not, they don't, they see it as a, a the fact that you've made the effort they think is amazing. And so they tend to take advantage of that and just give you a honest feedback. See, what I'm struck by there is you spoke about the, the purpose of the business is removing barriers for yeah. people to thrive and you're removing barriers to find out the truth. So mm. you're role modeling the purpose of the business, which I see the importance of. But I'm also intrigued by this idea of you phoning up the £10 a month customer because... I think one of my big frustrations when I go into businesses is how people scale up a problem and they'll go, can't do that, mate. Why not? Health and safety said. And then you say, what's the name of the health and safety manager? And they don't know, but it's a catch-all term that yeah. means that we don't have yeah. to do it. And yeah. you're almost a great example of that South Africa equivalent of can't do the fund budget. Why? Steve's taken it away. So it becomes about you yeah. and you often don't yeah. even know yeah, yeah. decisions yeah. being made yeah. in your name. Yeah. How do you stop people now getting wise to you? I'm talking about amongst your team yeah. where they almost give you the sanitized version of, Steve, you go and speak to them people because yeah. they'll tell you what you want to hear. Yeah. How do you avoid that yeah. echo chamber so, as a CEO? Yeah, so it's, it, 
it is it can be a bit of a challenge because obviously not everything I do is random, right? So if I, if I take that example of the small customer, we tend to schedule the calls now because what I've discovered is when I if I ring a customer completely out of the blue, it takes me it takes me a while to convince them that it's me, right? And so it's just it's wasted time and actually people people get a bit intimidated when sure. when someone rings. So we do tend to schedule them now. And so that means that someone is making a decision about who I speak to. So so I give a lot of feedback about um no, I want I want this type of customer or I want this cust these customers to be selected more randomly, etc. And it's the same when I'm traveling. This the because I walk out onto the floor, nobody can control who I speak to because I decide it's completely random. I just wander around. And and also look, I I've, I've been CEO for 4 years now. So so hopefully I've built up a bit of trust that people know that they can tell me things. And I, and of course I don't guarantee that just because somebody tells me something that I will do what they want. I mean in this particular example I gave you about the fund budget, the person was right and so I actioned it. But there are other examples when someone will say to me, well, you know, I really think you should replace this system because I don't like this system. And, you know, and then I go back to them and say, well, we chose that system for a reason. And if you take the, the, the total system infrastructure, this is why it makes sense. And so it might be slightly inconvenient for you, but in the total, it, it's better. So you also have to be prepared to listen, but say, okay, but having listened, I'm this is why I'm not going to do anything about it. What people don't like is being ignored. So if someone gives you feedback and then you go back a year later and they go, you know, I gave you some feedback a year ago and I, did anything happen? That's what really frustrates people. I think people are pretty good at, at, if you explain the context, people accept that I have to make choices. It's not, everything's not going to be perfect. I can't fix everything all at once. Um, and so when you build up a bit of trust, people trust that I make the decision as long as I communicate and, and, and tell them what's happening. I mean, that's a term that you've used a lot. It's a small word, but it does a lot of the heavy lifting, trust. And it's obviously hugely important yeah. to you. Would you tell us a little bit about what, about what you understand trust to be? Yeah, I think it starts with... Uh, if you have to do what you say you're going to do. So if you say you're going to do something and then you don't do it, people think, well, so he doesn't really mean it, does he? He doesn't really mean what he's saying. Um, and I think particularly when you're going through a lot of change, you're going through a lot of transformation, um, you have to make a lot of choices. You have to make a lot of decisions. And so being clear about what we're doing, but also being clear what we're not doing and why is really important. And then having communicated that, you really have to stick to it. So, you know, we all, you know, lack of clarity and lack of accountability where people don't really do what they say is a real enemy of getting things done. We, we had a period where um, we got somebody to help us um, create greater clarity over what we were trying to do because we, I felt we had, we had a best endeavors culture, right? Which means that we have a nice culture in Sage. People, people don't like to, you know, they always say, if you say, oh, can you do that? You, people say, yeah, yeah, I'll see what I can do. Well, what does that mean? Right? So if you're overloaded and you just keep telling everybody, I'll see what I can do, you can then choose which bits you do, and then when you don't do them, you just say, well, you know I'm overloaded. Well, that's not high performance. High performance is about saying, I can't do that, so no, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna do that, but I can do this, or, or look, that I just that's not a priority, I'm not doing that at the moment. And being prepared to have those conversations with each other, it's, this is not, this is, you know, what's, what's the, it's, you know, it's, it's being it's being open and honest with each other, um, but it's being accountable to each other. So sometimes in in and you see it you see it in a lot of organisations, not just business. Sometimes you get this kind of hierarchical structure, which we do still have a little bit of, where if in doubt, 
push it up, get the, get the senior people to make the decision, and then push it back down. Actually, what you need is, you know, on the pitch, on a day-to-day -day basis, you need people to make decisions, right? Because the coach can't be jumping on the pitch during during the game, right? The, the people who are there, the people who are on the phone to the customer, if if they if every, if every time the customer says something, they go, oh, I have to just check with my boss on that one, or I'll get back to you, da, 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 and then three days later. When I get customers writing to me, it's nearly always because they've been passed around and it's taken too long. It's very rare, actually, that a customer complains that we've sort of treated them badly and refused to address their concerns. But the person, if, if you can first time resolve something in the moment, people feel so much better about that. Even if, even if it's not entirely to their satisfaction, if you solve it in the moment, people feel good about that. If you're still messing around with it two weeks later and you've spoken to seven different people, which is what happens in a low accountability culture, that doesn't deliver great experience. So let's talk about creating this high accountability culture, which, let's be honest, comes down to recruitment. I mean, every business is a recruitment business. I know that you have a sort of no stars approach, even at the highest level. Yeah. And I'd love to talk about the the waiter or the waitress test as well, yeah, if yeah. you're if you're happy to. So yeah. how you recruit, what you look yeah. for, and the culture yeah. that it therefore yeah. creates. I think uh, you said it earlier. Look, I mean, at a you know, we all we all have an ego to some to some degree, right? I mean, it's part it's part of what what drives us to achieve. Um, but it has to start with you. You know, it has to start with the team. So the no stars is not about. I mean, I have a number of people who work for me who are very. You know, they're all very talented people, and in their own craft, in their own areas, you know, they are. You know known as as very high performing people within their craft but you have to sign up to the team the team comes first and therefore how you treat each other within the team really really matters and i've always always from a very early age um had this waiter test thing that i use which is how do people how do people treat someone who, you know, is serving them in a restaurant or a receptionist. You know, when someone walks into an office, do they say hello to the receptionist or do they just walk straight past them and ignore them? You want to be in my team? You, you need to respect all people, right? So you need to say hello to the receptionist. If you're in a restaurant and you've had a few drinks and you start getting arsy with the waiter, and speaking in an, in an obnoxious way, you can't work for me. That's just, that's... And how do so you deal with that? Because I think we've all seen it and been in that position. And I sometimes am annoyed with myself for thinking, you're just a dick. <laughs> but I don't say anything. Yeah. I just so what I do, there and... what I do now is, I think probably when I, when, when I was a bit younger, I, I, I just sort of noted it. I yeah. didn't really do anything about it. If it's, um, if it's within my team environment, I, I don't embarrass people in front of their peers, although increasingly I hope within my team environment that people call each other out. So you start to get a kind of self-regulating behavior amongst the team. Um, but, I w but what I do now is, you know, if it does happen, I speak one-on-one. -on -one and, you know, and then it's all about how the person reacts, right? If the person immediately goes, you're right. How do you put it to them? I describe the situation. I say, you know, that incident. How do you, how do you feel about that? How did, why, why did you speak to the person like that? What was the reason? And if the person then becomes defensive and says, "Well, you know, I was getting terrible service. They deserved it." I know that we got a problem, right? If they go, "No, you're right. I'm sorry. I'm tired. Yeah. It's been a bad day. I'll go and apologise to them." You're absolutely right. Thanks for pointing it out. That's the right behaviour, right? We're not. None of us are perfect, right? We all under pressure when we're tired can do things that we wish we hadn't done. Um, but if someone's good enough to point that out to you, then you need to be the sort of person who goes, you know what, you're, you're right. And it may not happen absolutely immediately. If you're, if, you're in a, if you're in a bit of an agitated state, it may take till the next day for you to reflect and go, no, God, he was so right, I shouldn't have done that, right? Um, 
But if if there's no acknowledgement, then you know you've got a problem. And I remember, um, um, actually, I, th this isn't my um, statement, I think. Um, I think I took this from the Barcelona principles, actually, Pep Guardiola. But when I, when I first became CEO, the first uh, leadership meeting we had where we had the top 80, 90 people in the room, um, I was talking about culture and I was talking about behaviours. And I said, every single person in this room is talented, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You're all capable, really, of doing what you've been brought here to do. But whether you stay here will be determined not by your talent, but by your attitude. And if you don't live the values every day, if I don't see you living and breathing and behaving in the way that we want, you won't be here. So what are the values, And We know we spoke about the first one. that you. So we have this overriding, as I say, um, you know, we... Uh, uh, we do the right thing. Yep. Um, we're human, right? Um, respect. You've got to. You've got to have this uh, respectful uh, behaviour. Bold, because if you if you don't um, if you don't push if you don't push the boundaries you don't try things um, you won't you won't you'll just achieve. Uh, mediocrity. Can I pick up on one of those values you spoke about, which is about being bold and innovating? Yeah. Because I think when you work through the logic of that, that means if people are pushing the envelope and, and going to the edges of what they think is possible, there's going to be cock-ups and mistakes yep. that inevitably yep. follow. And I'm interested in, as a leader, how do you create that yep. psychologically safe environment yep. where people can make errors yep. and know mm. that and know yep. that they're safe yep to do so without yeah. what favoring the consequences. What was the phrase Greg Hoffman, he was the former chief marketing yeah. officer of Nike, what did he say? He said failure is the price of ambition. Yeah, it's yeah. a great phrase, great phrase. This is something that is, it is very much work in progress. When I when I go around uh, doing my skip levels, I still get quite a lot of feedback that people are, are worried about making mistakes. Um, and, and, you know, I always, I always say whenever I get the opportunity, um, by definition, if we're pushing and we're trying to find new ways of doing things, things are not going to turn out as we expected. And so I sometimes use that phrase as well, say to people, look, if, if, if it worries you um, to use the word mistake, use that phrase. Well, it didn't turn out how I was expecting. Well, that's great because now you've learned something. So now let's try something else. But... But don't keep doing the same thing, right? So um, you know, don't if if you if you if you something doesn't turn out as you expected, well, don't repeat that particular experiment. Try a different one and try a different one. I mean, if you talk to people, you know, who've invented things or people who are successful um, with their you know entrepreneurs, etc., um, there are very very few, if any, that turn their first idea into something amazing. Most people have had 20 ideas, 30 ideas, 40 ideas. And what they've done is they have they just keep iterating them. So that's something that I, I talk a lot about is, is, you know, I've never fired somebody ever in my entire career for making a mistake. I nearly always ask people to leave because of behaviours or if they can't learn from the experiment. Because if you don't have good learn, learning agility, then you start repeating and 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 then that becomes a that becomes a performance issue but but to achieve great things you you've yeah you you've got to make mistakes you've got to have cock-ups i mean you know if i look back at my career i mean some of what we were talking about in marconi etc i mean there's there's been all sorts of things that, that i've tried that didn't work out the way i intended um but you keep going you keep trying you try different things and eventually if you're focused on well, where am I trying to get to? You've always got to kind of know what what am I trying to achieve? What's what's the point I'm trying to get to? And it's very rare that the path that you take is the one you thought. <laughs> so what would you say has been your biggest mistake that's led to the biggest breakthrough in your career, Steve? I think in that run up to um, you know, although although the um you know, the the Marconi restructuring or ending up with um, you know, the, the amount of debt we we had was not you know, they they were not my decisions. Um, I think I went in that run up to the dot com crash. I was as guilty as anybody of being over optimistic. So I said earlier, you know, you need to be when you're on the highs, 
don't get carried away. And when you're in the lows, don't get too despondent. I think in the late 90s, running up to 2000, um, I think everybody was on a massive, massive high. And pretty much everybody thought this was going to last forever. And when it started, when the signs came, everybody, including me, were slow, really, to see the signs because we we thought this would last forever. And and what that's done is the learning that's given me now is when I go through these highs and lows, um, when we're in the highs, people will often say, that's when I'm asking questions, that's when I'm starting to get restless, and people are like, oh, why can't you just enjoy the moment? So, well, because I need to, what's coming? What's coming? What do we? How? What are we going to have to react to? Because these things never quite last. Life's not linear. It's just not the way it is. And then, likewise, the other thing I learned from what happened in Marconi is, I think I'm really, really good now um, in a crisis or when things aren't going very well. Nobody wants to see the boss panicking, do they? Nobody wants to see the boss, you know, all hyper. You know, you. You know, I learned very early that my my any signs of anxiety from me are massively multiplied across the organization. Um, and so it's important that you, you, you're clear, you're calm, um, and therefore you, you, you know, we all have anxiety, right? To get high performance, I think pretty much everyone has anxiety, but, but you don't want to multiply that anxiety because too much anxiety can lead to poor performance particularly if it's multiplied across the whole organization. I remember one somebody saying to me, the way to get high performance, Steve, is everyone who works for you needs to be constantly anxious that you're going to fire them. Oh, my goodness. I think that is completely the wrong approach to high performance. But that was a little bit how it was in the 90s. Yeah. I remember in the 90s it was like, keep them on their toes, you know, and then they'll, they'll, they'll perform. And that leads me to the final question before we go into our quick fires at the end of the interview, which is... We're very careful on this podcast in this era of hustle culture and, you know, push yourself to the limit, burn the candle at both ends and chase your passion and never rest about saying, actually, that's not what high performance is. Yeah. So uh, I would just love to hear from you about creating boundaries, what yeah. you've done to make yeah. sure that, you know, life at Sage yeah. and business life is not your entire life. Yeah, I think balance is really, really important. I think to be successful on something, you have to be, you do have to be all in, but all in doesn't mean... 24 7 right it's uh you know my my life is not 24 7 of high performance you know when i when i'm at home i i treasure the time that i have at home with my with my wife my kids the family um and of course look things can happen right there can be a crisis which requires me to to get involved and, and intervene but i don't i don't plan on the basis that my team need to be available 24 seven. You know, I have, you know, people in my team who have young kids, they need to be able to create the boundaries so that they can, you know, go and see their kids at a sports day. They can take their kids to school. They can do, because it's all about the outcome. It's about, it's about balancing so that you're fit for the big moments. And I think when I was younger, I, I thought I could work, you know, flat out, not really have that much balance. And I remember one of the things I regret a little bit is when I was younger, I was I wasn't I'm still not great at it, but I was terrible at being present. So I would I would say, right, okay, I'll go to this event, right? Go and see my son at a sports day or whatever. But then when I got there, I wasn't there, right? I was in my head I was doing my to-do list. I was having, you know, those background conversations. And if someone spoke to me, I was having my background conversation at the same time I was speaking. I just mm. wasn't there. Was, so I've got much better at, um, at when I'm there, I'm present, and I don't expect my team to be at my constant um, beck and call. They know that if I call them on a Sunday, it's because we've got a crisis. I wouldn't do that as a norm because you have to, yeah, you have to have the balance. And I think sustained high performance, even in business, 
it requires fitness. It requires you to look after yourself. It's hard work. I mean, I run a global business. I travel a lot. You know, I'm 62 now. I don't get off the plane with quite the sort of bound in my step that maybe I did, uh, you know, and I suffer from jet lag more and stuff like that. So I've now got much better at, you know, I'll, I'll sit with my, my EA and say, look, you know, I'm on a flight back from New York. I know I'll only get four hours sleep. There is, it is completely pointless scheduling anything important the next day because I will not be able, I can do routine things, but if it's a big thing that requires real deep thought, it's pointless, I'll be tired. So don't do it that day, do it a different Love day. Love it, get to know yourself, it's so important. Yeah. Quick fire questions, Steve. The three non-negotiable behaviours that you and ideally the people around you should buy into. Yeah. It's all about the team. Yeah. It's got to, it's got to um, start with the um, team. Uh, you have to be all in. You have to be, you have to be emotionally connected to what we're trying to achieve, not just intellectually. It's, it's the emotional connection. Um, and you got to pass the weights test. Respect. Love it. What's your biggest strength and your greatest weakness? Um, I think I've always, and I still do. I, I, I have a way of finding a way of getting things done um, through teams. I think I'm a, I'm very much a, a team player. I, w I don't think I'd be a very good individual contributor. I never played individual sports. I only played team sports. So I think, yeah, I have a way of getting things done. I think despite the fact that I've worked really hard at it, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still not great at being in the present. So as soon as something, people often say to me, you don't really celebrate enough. And I know what they mean because as soon as something's happened, I'm thinking about the the next thing. I live, I live a lot in trying to anticipate where we're going in the future, um, and therefore I find it hard to to really, really be present and always fully in. I've got I'm a lot better, but I still don't quite. Do Possibly it. a strength as well, though. Hey. Yeah, I think it's one. Of, it's a trade off, isn't it? I think yeah. if if you like that, if you got rid of it completely. You'd probably struggle with the with with what drives me. It's part of what drives me, but it does frustrate me sometimes that you know I can uh, I can very quickly move on from a from an amazing moment because I'm already thinking about the next one. Uh, we have a high performance book club. Would you mind sharing a book with the club that maybe meant something to you or that you learned a lot from? Yeah, I I remember. I mean, I. This one, uh, I, I I can't remember when I read it. It was a, it was a good few years ago, but I, it, the timing just seemed right when I read it, which was the Long Walk to Freedom by Nelson Mandela. And I and I think that I remember why it was. I'd I'd been to uh, I'd been to Cape Town, and I'd been uh, we went to Robin Island, and we went to see the cell um, that that um, Nelson Mandela was in. And we were so fortunate to be shown around by someone who was in the prison at the same time as Nelson Mandela. And I, and I asked him, I said, what, what's the thing that you really remember about, about Nelson Mandela? And he said, do you know, it's amazing. He was so kind to the guards. I was like, wow, okay. And he said he was just like that. He, he, he wanted an inclusive society. Mm. So he was someone, so that, that inspired me to read his book. And then when I read his book, I was thinking, wow, talk about someone playing a long game, right? I mean, this, he, he, you know, he stayed so true to what he was trying to do at huge personal sacrifice. Um, again, not a perfect, not a perfect man. None of us are. Um, but yeah, he was very purpose driven. Very good. How important is legacy to you? Yeah, it's an interesting. I think um, not so much personal uh, legacy, but if we take what I'm doing at the moment at Sage, it is really, really important to me that um, when I hand the baton on, I've left it in much better shape than when I took it over. So making a difference, making an impact, you know, the thing that would hurt me the most, I think, is if someone said, you know, he he left that in a much worse position than he took it over, whether it was Sage or anything else. You know, I want to be that person who comes and adds something. I've obviously get a lot as well. I'm learning all the time, so I take away learnings. But yeah, I want to. I want to. I want people to just kind of think, yeah, you know, he he contributed. He left something. 
Lovely. And the final question, your departing message really after what's been a brilliant conversation, your one golden rule for living a high performance life. You have to be constantly open to learning. I think if you if you don't listen and I, I you know, you gotta listen and learn constantly. Um because otherwise you you don't maintain it. You you can achieve high performance but other people are doing different things all of the time. And if you're not listening and learning, you'll never maintain it because other people will do things differently and your high performance will turn into low performance, which is why if you look in business, it's so hard for companies to survive over generations because they get mm. out innovated and it's hard to do it when you, the hardest time to listen and learn and innovate is when you're at the top of your game. So interesting. Steve, thank you so much. That was brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Hey guys, it's Jake here. Listen, before you go, please do me just one favour. Hit subscribe. It makes such a difference to us. The more subscribers we get, then the bigger the channel becomes. The bigger the channel becomes, the bigger the names we can attract and the more impact we can have for you. So thanks for watching and please subscribe right now.